All right, we left off at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. That was the last verse that we left off. Now remember the context to remind people, especially those of you who are new, that way you don't get lost. Hebrews is one of the deepest doctrinal books, actually. Now we're covering this because of people who've been in our Bible study for many years now. And also for people who are familiar with dispensationalism are getting into it. So for some of you who don't know, what dispensationalism teaches is that not every verse in the Bible applies to you. Sometimes there are verses in the Bible that can apply to Old Testament Jews. For example, if you take God's name in vain, you are stoned to death. Well, obviously that does not apply to us. Then there are other verses in the Bible that teach about doing works for salvation. And if you are genuinely saved by faith, you got to keep it or you can lose it. People mistakenly apply that to Christians in the church. That's not true. Those verses will be applied to Jews in the tribulation. You're going to find that out in the book of Hebrews. Christians, our verses are, we can never lose salvation. Once we're saved by faith, it's always by faith. No matter how bad you fail in your work or how many times you sin in the future, you're still secured. So that, those verses are for Christians in the church. So notice how all these verses contradict each other if they're applied to one person. All right, there's got to be verses that apply to Old Testament Jews, verses that apply to Christians in the church age, that's us, and other verses that apply to Jews in the tribulation. So this is called the book of Hebrews, you notice that? So that's already a warning sign that this is for Jews. And actually, there are so many verses that talk about end times, tribulation. So these verses will be applied to the tribulation. These verses do not apply today, okay? They do not apply today. However, there are some verses here that Christians can claim. The reason why is because the writer is the Apostle Paul. The writer is the Apostle Paul. During this time... It is believed by Bible-believing teachers that Paul, as he wrote the book of Hebrews, he was introducing tribulation doctrine to Jews, his people. Now, for some of you who don't know, remember the apostles started ministering to Jews. Yeah. They didn't minister to Gentiles, which is us. So Christian doctrine was not really introduced yet. So it was doctrines to Jews who were preparing for the tribulation. Because remember, they're expecting their Messiah to come with his earthly kingdom. If you might recall, when Jesus came on the earth, Jews were expecting that, for Jesus to be their king and to conquer uh, the Antichrist government that time, which was Rome. However, because Jews rejected their Messiah, that became postponed. So it's been 2,000 years now. So remember, God switched from Jews to who? Gentiles. Gentiles. So because he switched to Gentiles, doctrines to Jews are no longer applicable. These are now doctrines to the church, Christian church. You notice God is no longer really using Jews today. He's using the Christian church. If there's a Jew who wants to be saved today, he's going to have to follow the Christian church. That's what he's going to have to do. But we believe that the church will be raptured soon, right? Amen. So once the, church gets, once the church gets raptured, then the tribulation starts and God is able to go back to the Jews again. Yeah, That's why when you look at Revelation chapter 7, you see 12 tribes of Israel during the book of Revelation. So God is going to go back to the Jews. So let's rewind a bit. The book of Hebrews is written by the Apostle Paul during a time when the Jews are ready to go through the tribulation, ready to have the rapture, ready to face the Antichrist. But because this is a transitional time, when Paul, his, he's the apostle to Gentiles, right? At the beginning, he was ministering to Jews, but, he's be but during his time in Arabia, he was in the desert for two years where he was given new doctrine, see? 
He was giving new revelation that other people didn't have before. And that's the doctrine of the church. So that's why in Paul's writing in the book of Hebrews, it's mingled with some church doctrine because it's new to him. It's being introduced to him. So he's writing doctrines that will apply to Jews in the tribulation. That's, what in his, that's what's in his mind. However, because he's being introduced church doctrine, it's mingled with church doctrine. So, in Paul's mind, he thinks that this church doctrine will be for tribulation Jews, and we will see that. But there's a double application where we can see this can also work with church. We're going to see that. And the reason why is because some verses clearly match with Paul's Gentile epistles, Romans through Philemon. So that's the key. If you see verses in Hebrews that matches with Romans to Philemon, Paul's Gentile epistles, then you know those verses, ah, the church can take this verse for themselves, even though this verse can also be tribulation Jew. Does that make sense? So uh, here's an example, all right? Here's a verse that says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now that's in the book of Hebrews. Now, Paul, he's writing that for tribulation Jews. You're only going to die once, and after that, you're going to face the judgment. But can't Christians take that verse too? Mm -hmm. Of course, because obviously we're all going to die one day, and after that we face a judgment. Yeah. See? So that's just how you do it, all right? Yeah. So how you do it is when you see a verse that, oh, actually this can work with Christian doctrine, then you know that you can claim that. But if there's a verse that goes, that seems different from Christian doctrine, then you automatically know that's going to be tribulation doctrine for Jews. All right, now that we understand this foundation, the background. Now let's get into it, all right? Now some of you are like, man, I didn't hear about that before. Welcome to a Bible-believing church. A lot of Bible-believing churches don't teach this dispensational truth. That's called dispensational truth. It's very, very important, okay? So I, you're going to enjoy this teaching, all right, on dispensationalism, and it's one of the deepest books in the Bible. So if you came for that one, then you, know, you came to the right one, all right? Yeah. Some of, you, some of you are like, man, I should be for those basic doctrine Bible books. You're right, you should be, but uh, the luck struck for you. The lucky lottery struck for you. You get to deep doctrines, all right? So here we go. Hebrews chapter 5, and then we're at verse 10, verse 10. Now remember the context of the chapter. Paul is talking about how Jesus Christ is superior uh, than the Levitical priesthood because Jesus' priesthood line is Melchizedek. Right. What he's trying to prove is that, remember, he's writing to Jews, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Jews have trouble receiving Jesus as their Messiah, remember? So that's why uh, the author, Paul, is trying to persuade those Jews that Jesus is a superior being, he is the Messiah, and one example is that he has a better priesthood in the Levitical priesthood. So that's the context. All right, verse 10. Called of God. So Jesus is called of God. And high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is called by God to be a high priest after Melchizedek's order. So that's the priesthood that he's following. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Okay, so Jesus Christ, Paul says, we have many things to say about him but they're hard to explain. That's what utter means. They're hard to explain to you Jews. Why? Because from how we see it, you're dull of hearing. So he's talking about spiritually their ears. They cannot grasp what they're saying, what Paul's saying to them in their ears. So it's like they're dull. Now, you notice the Jews always had this problem when we go to Acts 28. Go to Acts 28. Now, notice by this time, Paul was so fed up with the Jews, he said that we're turning to the Gentiles. So he said this at a time in Acts 28 that was written after the book of Hebrews then. This was probably uh, mentioned after the book of Hebrews, Acts chapter 28. Notice what Paul said to those Jews when we look at Acts chapter 28 and then verse 21, verse 21. And they said unto him, We neither receive letters out of Judea, Judea concerning thee, 
neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. Okay, so this is what Paul said. Verse 23, And when they appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. See, he's using Jewish arguments. Right. See that? Just like he's doing in Hebrews. But notice what Paul said at verse 26, 26, saying, Go unto this people, and saying, Hearing ye shall hear, and what? Shall not understand. Look at verse 27. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their what? Ears are dull of hearing. That matched with the book of Hebrews. All right, let's go back to Hebrews. So there's no doubt he's speaking to Hebrews here. He's speaking to Jews. Verse 12, Hebrews 5, 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. All right, that's a mouthful. Now, look how I explain each and every word. So when I explain, look at the verse, just look at the verse and see if my explanation matches. So the author is saying uh, why they're dull of healing. It's because for at a time when you should be teachers by now, because you know the word of God, you're Jews, right? You need someone, all of you need someone, so that's what ye means, that's plural for all of you. All, all of you need for someone to teach you again. Mm -hmm. Come on. Starting from what? The basic doctrines, which be the first principle. The basic doctrines of God's word. That's what oracles of God mean. Oracle is basically like an oracle. Something you're looking into what, uh, uh, what the pagans and even Christians or all religions talk about, like uh, trying to see what uh, divine or what the Lord is speaking. There's a prophecy coming out. So that's why we call this the Word of God, because it's prophecy. It's directly from Him, His deity, Amen. divinity, divine. So we see right here that the oracles of God is referring to the words of God, basic doctrines from the Word of God. So Paul is saying that he has to teach them this again. But by now, he's saying they should be this. They should be into the me. They should be knowing a lot of deeper doctrines. Now, he continues on in verse 12, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So he says that you became those who need milk. That's what basic doctrines is referring to, that milk. That's what baby, newborn babes drink. Why? Because baby-leveled Christians or baby-leveled saints here, that's referring to the Hebrews, they are not able to handle deeper doctrine. So because of that, they're not aged, all right? They're not grown. Continuing on, uh, they're not able to eat strong meat like steak. That's strong meat there. Babies certainly cannot eat that. They can't handle it. You ever taught doctrines where Christians nowadays, they can't handle it? Why? Because they're babies. They're babies. Verse 13, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Meaning that anyone who uses, constantly uses milk to teach to their churches. And that's like 90% of the churches you go to today. All right, the love of Jesus Christ, you know. Salvation by faith. And then the Holy Spirit, and they, don't, they even get that wrong. And then they do speaking in tongues and healings and all that, which is wrong doctrine itself. So they said that they keep just teaching milk. That means those people are unskillful in the word of righteousness. They're, they're not skilled in God's word. They don't know much about God's word because they're a babe. There's a lot of pastors today who have... Uh, THMs, Master of Theologies, DDs, Doctor of Divinities, THDs, do uh, Doctor of Theologies, PhD, Doctor of Philosophies, and they are babies in the Bible. Come on. They don't know how to teach their people. Yeah. These guys are something else for their babes. Verse 14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use. Okay, so strong meat, this kind of doctrine, Okay, heavy doctrine, belongs to those who are full of age. They're not babies, they're grown up. Including those who 
by that very, uh, by that very reason of constantly using the Bible, see, by reason of use. All right, that's what verse 14 said, right? You're looking at that one? In my explanations, keep looking at the verse, see if it matches. So by that very reason of constantly using the Bible, they got their senses exercised. So they got the sense now to what, the verse is, to discern what's good and what's evil. They got their senses exercised where they can tell what's right and what's wrong. You know why a lot of Christians in churches today can't tell the difference no matter how many times you tell them? They don't get into the Word of God. They're babies. So because of that, they're not growing in it. They cannot tell what's good and bad. They think that every Christian church is the same. If you think like that, you don't know your Bible. That means you don't know your doctrine. We make a very big deal. They call us being divisive on denomination and etc. No, that's not called division. That's called being doctrinal. I'll tell you who wants ecumenical, who wants the whole world to unite, that it turns into globalist, all right? That's the devil, all right? So that's the devil's mentality. He wants to unite things, pretend that there's no distinction of right and wrong doctrine, but that everything's right. That's why now you're tolerating different genders and colors of the rainbow now, because they can't tell what's right and wrong. They think that everything's okay. See, they, uh, so when Christians become more liberal in their doctrine, See, that means that they're wrong. Yeah. What are churches trying to do? They're making you more liberal in their doctrine. What do I mean by liberal? I don't mean Democrat. I mean by being more liberal is being more tolerating yeah. in doctrinal differences. Yeah. When you get there, you're in the wrong church, period. Yeah. Now, obviously, I don't mean to be divisive and be like a jerk either. There are those too. All right, there are those who, uh, who just act like a jerk that they're even doctrinally wrong when they think they're doctrinally right. But the point is, is that there's got to be a balance here, all right? You can't just be one extreme or the other. Yeah. Now, let's examine verse 12 through 14 because we're going to learn a lot of good stuff right here. So, uh, it was already explained, but let me explain even further. So, keep your hand at Hebrews 5, and then I want your other hand to go to uh, 1, Peter chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Two places, 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. And then your other one to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, uh, we're called born again Christians, correct? Yeah. That means if you're born again Christian, that means you're born. See, you're a newborn. Mm -hmm. So you're a newborn babe. So if you're a newborn babe, what you've got to be doing is you've got to be uh, drinking the milk. But if you're stuck on milk, if your baby is stuck on milk and it's, let's say, think about this, all right? Normally a baby, all right, when you're looking at them, they're supposed to be eating more solid food. But if they keep drinking milk when they're two and three and four, then you got serious issues. Now, if you see a bunch of these Christians who've been saved more than four years in the churches and they act like this, man, you got serious issues, man. No wonder that the devil can slaughter all those Christian churches easily. Why, they're babies. That's horrible. Why? It's a sign of carnality. It's a sign of carnality. Not that you're spiritual, you're carnal. Go to 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And I, brethren cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Whoa. So pa Paul says, when I'm preaching to you, I can only preach in carnality, not spiritually. Why? Because even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Oh, we got a problem here. Paul says he keeps feeding them milk because they're carnal, and that he's preaching them carnally now. Now, I got a question. 90% of churches who are babes, who are stuck on milk, aren't they carnal? Mm, come on. Don't pastors have to do carnal programs? That's right. Carnal music? Yeah. Carnal dressing? Yeah. Carnal standards? And make everything so carnal so they can adapt to the culture of that time 
go down to their level and stay right there and minister to them. That is the mindset of a Calvary Chapel mindset. That is the mindset of a non-denominational mindset. That's the mindset of a new evangelical charismatic. That's the mindset a majority of churches today. And that is evil. That's wicked. That's carnal. Amen. If you keep feeding them milk, there's a reason why. Because Paul said they can't handle the meat at verse 2. So if they keep feeding the milk, how are they going to keep entertaining them? They have to make it carnal. Yeah. More and more. more, and, more. Yep. and you wonder why churches are so messed up? Yeah. They're hardly Christian churches. Here's the easy way to tell. Okay, You know how you can tell that that's like a carnal uh, church? All right. When you walk inside there, you can't tell if you're walking inside a, a liberal university classroom yeah. or a bar or a church. Come on. Walk inside. And you can't tell. That's true. Come on. If they, if they just don't mention Bible or Jesus, you can't tell the difference, man. That's a mess. Right. Look, you walk in here, you'll know you'll walk into a church. Yeah. You'll know like really fast. All right? You'll know really fast. So that's the reason why uh, the problem with these people is that they're stuck on milk. Basic doctrine. When you start teaching them deep doctrine, heavy doctrine, they'll accuse you for being judgmental. They'll accuse you for lacking charity. And blah, 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 blah. That's what they'll do. No, what they want you to do is, I'm jealous of you uh, eating all the meat. I want you to be a baby like me. That's what they want you to do. They want you to stunt your growth like them. That's carnality. That's wickedness. Uh, here's the thing about milk, what it's supposed to do. Keep your hand here at 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Yes, sir. 1 Peter 2. Now, notice uh, what the Bible says at verse 2. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Keep your hand at 1 Corinthians 3. We're going to come back here. Go to 1 Peter 2.2. 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, why do you want the milk of the word of God? That ye may what? Grow thereby so that you can grow. Here's the thing. The purpose of getting milk to begin with is so you can grow to this. Not stay stuck on milk. <laughs> Drinking milk is not to get stuck on milk. Do you understand? All right. Mommy is not feeding baby milk so that they can expect to be stuck on milk. Yeah. Mommy is feeding the milk because they expect that baby to grow. So if you're drinking milk to grow, then you're in the right path here. But if you're just drinking milk just because drinking milk, then you, you got a problem, man. Yeah. See, even milk itself is supposed to make you grow, not get stuck. Not get stuck. That's a problem. All right. Now, uh, keep, your hand at, uh, keep your hand at those two places because I want to show you something important. Now, go to Hebrews 5 again. Hebrews uh, chapter 5. You'll notice verse 13, as I mentioned before, they don't know uh, much of the Word of God because they're babies. They can't tell the difference at verse 14 of what's good and what's evil in this world, right and wrong doctrine. All right, so now that, I, uh, now that I've preached and rebuked against those who are stuck on milk, now I'm going to get to those who want to get on meat here. Now, this is something, okay? The devil always uses two extremes, okay? Not just one or the other. He uses two extremes. Now, there are those who want to get into the meat, yeah. right? As soon as they come to a Bible-believing church, they're hungry, which I don't blame them. Yeah. Why? Because they've been in a milk, a milk sop church. And they just want to get into the meat. But because they're just starving to death and just want to eat the meat, when you chow this stuff down, what's going to happen? You're going to choke yourself, it's indigestion. You're going to hurt yourself. So you have to be careful of that. Now, uh, Internet is one of the biggest things where we're able to find, uh, where I was able to teach deep doctrines, and people have been able to get, get access to it, which is a blessing. But it's also been a curse for some of you who don't understand. You might say, why? Because when you get into deep doctrine, you and I can admit this, it gets into weird territory. Can we agree with that? Genesis 6, sons of God intermingling with humans, that's not normal. That's weird. We know that. 
All right, that's weird, satanic stuff that's going on. All right? And a lot of churches, they don't teach that which they should realize that they should be teaching, that's not sons of Seth, those are fallen angels. So pastors ought to know better than that. But here's the thing, now people get into deep doctrines, so then like another one, end times, right, especially 2020. Man, we're seeing that all over the world, end times. The Antichrist can set up the one world government any moment, stuff like that. You can see globalist conspiracies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of deep doctrinal stuff. But then what happens then is because you keep chewing down on that, you ignore the milk, the basic doctrines here. Now, think about it. Don't you think it's unhealthy if your whole body and mind and soul is filled with globalist 666, antichrist, satanic minions mingled with human beings? Don't, don't you think that's an improper uh, Christian growth? Wouldn't you say so? <laughs> What happened to uh, the basic doctrines as well? The doctrine of the Holy Spirit, salvation by faith, a charity with other people and all that. Now think about this. You cannot start here. We all like to start here because of the milk soppy churches. But that's not what you're supposed to do. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to grow more into here that becomes more solidified. See this blue thing from the milk to the black here? So see this? You're supposed to always start here where it's growing like this. You're not supposed to be here because this verse says aged. You're not aged. What are you? You're here, newborn. You forget where you're at. Even a baby, even with the good intention that a baby is sick of the milk, want to grow up more, the baby can't just uh, fast grow itself, all right? You always, you, you've seen your kids. Sometimes the kids want to do big adult grown-up stuff, and you have to say, you got to be patient. You got to wait. You got to do the kid stuff more. Be faithful in those little things. Then you can be faithful in the big things. See, if you're not faithful in these little things, how can God trust you with the big things, right? So you have to get here. You have to concentrate here, starting here. Make sure all of it is covered. And I mean everything covered. Don't skip steps or stages. Cover everything here. That way you can have a proper childhood growth. Amen. And you don't have a traumatic experience as an adult, if that makes any sense to you. That's good. That's good. Right? You've seen people with childhood where they skip certain stages, yeah. messed up, and then as adults, it really messed them up when they were doing grown adult stuff in jobs. Grown adult stuff with relationships with people. Grown adult stuff with taking care of a family. Grown adult stuff being a leader. These are the type of people who want to get into me and pastor a church. Really? Be a leader? After you skip and stunt it as skip stages in your childhood? That's no. You got to do basics like he said, all right? You got to major. You got to perfect, cover everything that way. And then trust me, I always say this. Major in the milk, and the meat will naturally come to you. How I'm able to get into deep doctrines. Uh, you know, here, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people know me about conspiracies and times and then uh, stuff like that. But you got to realize this. I never taught that until after three years, almost three years of teaching basic doctrine to my church. And then about four more years covering uh, intermediate level doctrines. Yeah, it took me about seven years. Then I got into the deep stuff. That's where I got into conspiracies and all that kind of stuff, which is very interesting. And people should know about it. They should be aware of the evil. But here's the thing is that evil should be the last on your list compared to first doctrines. I want to major in God's word, not in the devil's world, if that makes any sense to you, right? Knowing too much of the devil's operation and evil I mean, here's the thing. Why do you want to know more about the devil stuff more than God stuff, right? It just makes you mad. Let's be honest. Doesn't it just make you mad when you study the devil's world more? It just makes you mad. That's it. Makes you sick to your stomach about certain leaders and all that. That's not how God intended with your salvation. <laughs> yeah, God intended for joy, peace, long-suffering. He already knows all the evil going on in the world. Yeah, so he wants you to major in this first. See, uh, you're going to see these basic doctrines later on too. And then let this stuff naturally come to you. See that? Yeah. All right, so notice some things here where uh, I say all that because notice a couple things right here. 
Notice verse 14, strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. See that? So see, you're not aged in your Christianity yet. You're here, newborn babe. So you, that means you got to get into the milk. Meat does not belong to you. Here's another one. The verse says to get the meat, it's by verse 14, by reason of use, have their senses exercised. So how many times have you read through that book? How many verses have you memorized? Do you know even the basic memory verses of soul winning, how to get a soul saved? Do you know the basic verses on that once saved, you're always saved? Do you know some basic verses on the promises of God? Do you even know the nine fruits of the Spirit? Do you know uh, some of the names in, of, of the people in the Bible? Do you know Adam's three sons, not just two? You probably don't even know his two sons. Do you know Noah's three sons? Do you know Noah's three sons? Do you know, uh, do you know that Jesus had siblings? What? I didn't know he had siblings. Well, that's a problem. You should know that. That's basic. All right. So uh, do you know Mary's husband's name? Jesus' uh, uh, Jesus' mother's husband name? All right. Do you know uh, Jesus' two brothers' name? Do you know the last book in your Bible in the Old Testament? Do you even know if I say the book of Obadiah? Can you find that in your Bible? No. So see, no. <laughs> no, honesty, amen. We got honesty here, amen. It's good to have honesty. See, this is basic stuff. Yeah, that's good, brother. If we don't know this and we know all this other deep doctrines, there's something we skipped here, see that? Right. Something that's improper. So that's why we got to go back here. We got to go back here and then be able to get it right. All right. Uh, another thing is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When we go over here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, here's another sign. In, if you look at verse 3, okay? Well, I can get into the meat. You know one thing I notice what's strange about people who want to jump into the meat? These are certain signs from them in verse 3. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions... Are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Right. You know what these people are, uh, sign, uh, carnal people are? They think that they're right because I'm a certain name, but everybody else is wrong. And then they divide and fuss about the Bible to them. But notice right here, that's a sign of carnality. You see that, verse 3 and 4? You know one thing I notice about people who always jump into the meat? They never get along with fellow Bible-believing people. They always fight, fuss, you know, act doctrinally correct. Here, let me tell you something. Look, if there are people who are doctrinally wrong, I get it, all right? Doctrinally wrong, I get it, okay? But if you're in your own crowd, if God gave you the best church, the best crowd to be in of Bible believers, you're not going to get any better than that. And for you to say, you're all wrong and I'm right, and correcting people here and there on doctrine, you, then uh, you got a problem right here. You, you didn't get this one right. The verse said you're still a baby at verse 3. Carnal, you're part of that baby level still. All right, so one thing I notice about people who think that they can get into here, they're still over here. Why? Because of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, there's still divisions. Yeah envying strife. All right, that's a sign of carnality. So that's why you got to check yourself. Why? Too much, no, uh, you ever met a nerd that just bothers you? A nerd that just bothers you, just corrects you on every technical little thing that you're like, so what? It's a big deal, all right? A toilet's a toilet. I don't care if you want to call it some kind of scientific terminology, right? Have you seen those weirdos doing that, you know? That's the problem with people who are so much into this that they will correct every little thing right. from you. From the diet that you eat, from every nitpicky behavior that you do, yeah. from the choices you make in the medical field, with how, uh, uh, how you take care of your kids and family, nitpicky on. on every little thing, okay? Every little thing. These are the people that see satanic symbols in everything, including the, the, the freeway that you see. Uh, all right. 
Now, do I believe they're satanic symbols? Sure they are, but when you get so much into that, then you become nitpicky. That's right. Didn't you know people are nitpicky now with the hand si signals that I'm doing by accident? Yeah. They, they, they see, uh, I guarantee you this, all right? I, I, I've done 10 satanic symbols without you and I knowing it. Yeah. Just research it, be a nerd about it, you will find it somewhere, all right? I bet you this was a satanic symbol right now. <laughs> This is a unicorn for some of you who don't know. It represents the obelisk for some of you who don't know. It's a phallic symbol and all that. See, you're, the mind can go on and on. Mind can go on and on. By the way, so, uh, just the last thing to say. Some of these people who are so nitpicky about symbolisms and all that, didn't you know even your iPhone, if you were to open it, all those icons that open up the front page, like Google and all that, you can find satanic symbols all over there? So why don't you throw away your cell phone? But this is where I find truth. No, it has satanic symbols. Throw it away. <laughs> See that? So it can go on and on. It can go on and on. I don't want to use credit card mark. I'm going to use cash and coin because of the devil system here. Well, didn't you know cash and coin also has occultic symbols in the back? Masonic symbols? I thought that's basic Illuminati 101, right? The pyramid, I? And that's true. It is true. Those are satanic symbols, all right? It's true. But you see my point? My point is we can be so right about everything and be nitpicky that it becomes like, so what, you know? Because this is the devil's world. What did you expect, right? This is the devil's world. This is the devil's playground. When God sets up his physical kingdom on the earth, he'll set everything right. All right, so we have to understand that. So nitpicky, that's the thing, all right? Now, look, you're not going to... Me, I am critical. I point out wrong doctrine. Everybody, uh, a lot of my enemies know that. Even pastors accuse me of that, of being divisive. So if I'm divisive enough with my level and you're more divisive than me, don't you think that you're getting out of bounds here? Yeah. Here's the thing. What we're supposed to be divisive and what we're supposed to attack is people who is not the right church, the right crowd, yeah. all right? But if you found your right crowd, your right family, your right group, all right, you don't have to be nitpicky enough, That's right. all right? That's what you have to do, all right? That's why I stress so much about finding a good Bible-believing church. Why? It's a good start. Once you find your crowd, yeah. then you know the level after that, all right? So you have to do that. You have to find your right family your right church, then from there you can establish something, all right? Okay. Then you know which boundaries not to cross, which boundaries to cross. All right, now, uh, when we go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, the verse says, as newborn babes desire, right? Mm -hmm. Desire the sincere milk of the word. Here's the thing. If you're a babe in Christ, you got to be desiring this. Yeah. If you're despising this, and coveting this, you're not in the right place. If you're a newborn babe in Christ, all right, and look at babies, all right? Babies are not people who just uh, went through two years of Christianity. See a two-year-old, you still see them as a baby. All right, it takes naturally a lot of time. So if you're that baby level, you got to still desire this. Didn't you know that there are times when I'm here, I desire this? That's right still in there. Right. Things that I desire from my childhood that I wish I could have done better. See? So you don't have to, so you don't have to bypass this. You can make this better. You have the chance to make it better. So make good use of it, all right? All right, now we go to uh, chapter 6. Chapter 6. So we've understand the balance here. Uh, basic doctrines and deep doctrines. The problem with <coughs> two extremes of Christian churches, it, and it caused so much carnality nowadays, unfortunately. All right, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Now, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. So Paul is saying, now, uh, so remember, he was rebuking those who are not getting into deeper doctrines those who are still stuck in the first principles here, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. He's blaming them for getting stuck in the first principles. So he's saying that's why we should leave now these first principles and go on to perfect ourselves more into growing. That's what he argues. You might say, why? 
Well, let's keep continue reading, reading on. I'll show you why. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. Okay, so he's saying we don't want to start all over again, the first principles. Because remember, that's what he was complaining at verse 12, 13, and 14, right? The first principles, I have to teach you again. You guys aren't growing. So he says, I don't want to lay again the foundation. So these are the first principles. These are the basic doctrines. The foundation of what? Repentance from dead works. Okay, so dead works is referring to basically the evil works. It's referring to bad works, works that die out. So basically, repentance of your sins, repentance of your evil. Uh, that's the basic doctrine, right? We believe that uh, we should, that this is a sin, that's a sin, that's a sin. We got to repent and we got to live our lives clean. Amen? So that's the basic. We, if, there, uh, if you're like, well, I didn't want to go to that church, then go to those que queasy churches. They won't teach that. All right? They'll teach you to tolerate every sin in the book. All right? Come to this church. We'll make you find out sins and you never thought were sin before and you'll get offended and you'll walk out. Yeah, or you might go, about time. Yeah. I needed That's that. Right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I needed that. I wanted to get right with God. I wanted to find out this was sin. I didn't know it was a sin before. Thank you for telling me that. I'm glad to be in this church. You're in the right place. You're going to love us. All right. That's what's going to happen. All right. You're amongst people who love good, hard preaching and we just want to get on the altar and get right with God. That's right. We just Amen. love that. We love that. All right. That's a basic doctrine foundation. And a faith toward God. So having faith toward God is another first principle of the doctrine of baptisms. Now, plural, you see that? Yep. Yeah. So that's a basic doctrine. So Paul's arguing that there's more. Uh, he's not arguing a basic doctrine of baptism, but baptisms. Yeah, that's right. That means there's more than one baptism in the Bible. You might go, I didn't know that. Well, that's a basic doctrine. Yeah, that's right. You, so it's called seven baptisms. I'm not going to cover it here, but seven baptisms. There's a baptism of suffering uh, where Jesus talked about that, the cup that I would drink, baptized with the baptism. Uh, are you able to take it? Mark chapter 1, John said, talked about the baptism of fire, baptism of water, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So those are three right there, right? And then you get uh, the baptism of Moses, all right? And then you also get the Acts 2.38 baptism of Peter. And then so there's a lot of other baptisms that can be covered. All right. Spiritual baptism, that's another one, 1 Corinthians 12. Mm -hmm. But anyway, continuing on. And of laying on of hands. Yeah. So that's the next baptism. So the laying of hands, uh, you'll notice that when people get ordained to the ministry, they'll lay their hands on them. As they lay their hands on them, then uh, they... Uh, receive the ordination to become a pastor. You don't ordain an amateur of the Word of God. You get someone who grows, who's experienced in the Word of God. So that's a basic doctrine. Everyone should know about that. It could also be possible the laying on of hands is referring to the healings during that time. Because remember, Jews received the signs and wonders during this time. The Acts of the Apostle, right? That's why it's called Acts of the Apostle, Book of Acts. Healings were going on. They were laying hands on them. So it could be covering that one. End of resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm. So you got to get the resurrection of the dead doctrine right. Do you know how many theologians mess up on this doctrine? Mm, come on. You get pre-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, pre-millennial, post-millennialism, amillennialism. They don't get this doctrine right. That should be a basic. You know what the basic is? Pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah. Premillennialism. That's a basic doctrine, resurrection of the dead. All right? If, and a lot of people don't even know that. Yeah. A lot of people don't even know that. They got to get the rapture doctrine right. A lot of people even deny a rapture completely. So this is a really basic doctrine stuff people ought to know about. And of eternal judgment. So obviously we believe in that, that after you die, you're, you're judged with hellfire for eternally, or you go to heaven for eternally. Well, surprisingly, Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, get that wrong. All right? They don't believe in eternal judgment. So these are basic doctrines that we're all supposed to know. These are fundamentals of the faith. Hence, you get fundamentalist Christians, yeah. their foundation. But Paul says we're supposed to leave these fundamentals and go on to perfection. We're supposed to grow. Go to every statement of faith of every Christian church. They get their fundamentals right, nearly all of them. 
Nearly all of them get their fundamentals right. But that's why they're still babies. And Paul said, we got to get away from that and go on to perfection. That's a problem with people nowadays. Notice in verse 3, and this will we do if God permit. So Paul is saying, so uh, if God will allow us so, that's the idea. If God will give us the strength, if God will give us the grace, then we will do that. So notice right here that this is like an enduring. You notice that? The tone of the language here. So he's saying by God's grace, we're going to get away from our basic doctrines and then go into deeper doctrine. Why? Because he is concerned that they're going to backslide. They're going to become babes. That's what Christians are doing right now. Oh, that they would have this prayer. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Oh, that every Christian church would have that, right? That's good, preacher. Come on. They won't do that. They, that's hardly a part of their prayer. Wow. It's hardly a part of their prayer. Why don't they start praying, by God's grace, we will uh, get away from the basic doctrine and start advancing more for the Lord, study more doctrines. <laughs> uh, church members don't do that nowadays. Now, why is Paul warning about that? Now, notice right here a losing of salvation. So that does not sound Christian then. So red flag, then we can see this will be tribulation Jew. Verse 4, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. So Paul's saying it's impossible that those who got their eyes open, that's what enlightened is, right? And that they tasted God's heavenly gift. So we can guess right here salvation and we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. So notice they're partaking the Holy Ghost. They're in the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God. So they just tasted God's word. They've heard God's word and the powers of the world to come. Oh, that, this is different. So they've tasted the powers of what? The world to come. What is the world to come? Remember, that's future future end times of the world, the futuristic world. So then this is not Christians then. This is referring to end time Jews. So this is referring to end time Jews because he's talking about a futuristic or an end time world that they've tasted its power. So this is going to be referring to tribulation Jews then who've tasted it, who've partook in the Holy Ghost. Now they had a, a taste of God's word. They had a taste of the futurist, futuristic world, the millennial world. Verse 6, uh, so the power of that millennial world, it could be, for all I know, it could be referring to the Jewish signs and wonders because we see those miracles happening during the tribulation through the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. So probably they partook in that. They were able to taste it. God is able to send manna down from heaven during the tribulation. I do know that one. Or basically any power of God that the tribulation Jews experience during that time. Any power of God that the tribulation Jews get to experience that time. Now here's one example, all right? Let's look at Matthew 4, all right? I'll show this part, Matthew 4. Now Jesus was preaching about the gospel of the kingdom, right? In Matthew 4. Now the kingdom here is that millennial kingdom, futuristic kingdom that the Jews were waiting for. That's the world to come. They're waiting for their future world where Jesus Christ will set up his kingdom as Messiah. So it's, notice right here, it's a kingdom gospel. You see that, right? Kingdom gospel, kingdom doctrine. You can see elements of that in the book of Hebrews. Powers of the world to come. Notice how this matches well with Matthew 4. Notice Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No, that's not what it said. The gospel of the what? Kingdom. kingdom. See, it's that futuristic messianic kingdom for the millennium that the tribulation Jews need to hear. And healing, oh, here's the powers, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. See that? The powers that accompany that kingdom gospel. So notice that matches with Hebrews 6. The Jews are tasting those powers 
of the world to come, that kingdom. See, Jews experienced that ever since the time of Jesus to the Acts of the Apostles. Remember, during that time period, what were the Jews anticipating? The messi Messianic kingdom, yeah. that world to come, that futuristic world. But we do know what happened. They rejected it, right? So it's yeah. been postponed for 2,000 years. Okay, so now we understand more and more the doctrine of the book of Hebrews, what's going on. So this is not Christians then. So then, the idea is this, is that these tribulation Jews who partook in the Holy Ghost, who uh, had a taste of the powers of the kingdom, uh, the kingdom doctrine, God's word, became partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the heavenly gift, their eyes were open. Notice verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. And uh, let me move around over here and put him to an open shame. So uh, notice right here, I'm going to explain each and every word. So remember verse 4, it's impossible. See that? The idea is it's impossible those who partook in all those good things from God, that at verse 6, if they fall away from that, that they'll be able to be renewed. In other words, they'll be able to do it again to repent. They can't repent again. Why? Because they're going to open up Christ's wound, his crucifixion afresh again. They're going to open up his wound, his, crucifix, cru his crucifixion afresh, open up his wounds again, and then they're going to make Jesus Christ an open shame to everybody. So that's why right here they've got to maintain it. They've got to keep going on. Now you might go, uh, why is that right there? Well, the reason why is this, okay? So now we're summarizing Hebrews 5.12 to Hebrews 6.6, 6, all right? I've explained things where Christians can learn from these verses, right? And some of these work, uh, most of these verses work for Christians. But when we look at the context of everything, we can see how it'll easily apply to tribulation Jews. The idea is this, remember there's so, uh, isn't there so much deception now? Okay, thank God you're not a tribulation Jew and 666 is not out yet. Yeah. You know why? If it was, do you know how hard it is to find truth? Yeah. Some of you are already searching for truth and you just bumped into lies. Yeah. Imagine when the Antichrist comes yeah. and then AI takes over YouTube, Facebook, Google and all that. All right. And then uh, everyone's trying to search for truth. Guess what, man? It's going to be so confusing that if you don't study that book, and start growing and knowing that book a lot, the doctrines of this Antichrist world will deceive you easily. And he can make them believe that he is Christ and you should take 666 in your right hand. Do you realize that? That's scary, isn't it? That's scary. Do you know how many Christians fail to grow in their doctrine? They're fortunate they're going to be raptured before the tribulation starts because then they'd lose their salvation. But remember, Christian salvation is different. Christian salvation is once saved, always saved. So that contradicts a tribulation Jew who loses salvation. It makes a lot more sense you divide these two doctrines. That Christians are in their Christian doctrine, they have a pre-tribulation rapture. Jews are the ones who go through the tribulation. And they have to endure to be able to maintain their rapture at the end. So Jews... That's why they have to know their doctrine. They have to uh, stay planted. Because notice right here that if they just know the foundation, basic doctrines, G the deity of Jesus Christ, Jesus is God, the Antichrist can say, I'm Jesus. Yeah. Worship me as God. Simple. Salvation by faith. We believe salvation by faith. Do you know how the Catholic Church is now pushing that? Mormons are teaching salvation by faith. And Christians in Christian churches can't tell the difference now with a Mormon and a Christian. That's how bad we are. So the Antichrist just had to put his religion there too. See, so it's just, and he'll claim salvation by faith. And then it'll just cause more confusion. Put your faith in me, says the Antichrist, right? Put your faith in me. Show the faith by putting this mark, the Holy Spirit sealing in your right hand and in your forehead. 
Look at that. See that? This is just dangerous stuff. I mean, did you see those Catholics? How they, you, you doubt that? You seen the Catholics putting that kind of a mark Come on. on people's forehead on Ash, you know, Wednesday and stuff like that? And then uh, you've seen, uh, I mean, we can go on and on, all right? But anyway, the point is, they can't just know this stuff. They got to dig deeper into deep doctrine and know this kind of stuff. That way they don't get caught up with the end. Because see right here, this foundation, fundamentals, is being broken by the false doctrines of the Antichrist right here. So it's crushing in that you can't tell the difference from the tear and the wheat. You can't tell the difference from a thorn from a fruit. So Hebrews is going to cover that here. You ever heard these uh, churches talking about, you know, uh, distinguishing the tear and the wheat and then, you know, you're, uh, if you're really a Christian, let's prove you're really a Christian and then it makes you get afraid and doubt your salvation. That's not for the Christian church. That's tribulation. Tribulation, it's, uh, there's going to be that thing with the wheat and tear and then the fruit and the thorn. That's not Christians, you have to realize. So when Christian churches are trying to scare you about your salvation, you know, you could be a fake Christian. You could be a professing Christian. You could be one of those thorns that can't tell from the fruit. And No, no, that's for tribulation. That's for tribulation. So anyways, uh, we're going to be covering just a bit of that. I don't think we can cover all of that tonight. Already the time's up. Would you believe it? So I'll have to cover just a very little bit of that. All right. But first, let's uh, cover some false arguments here. OK, so here are some wrong arguments from the people. So notice right here, their salvation is dependent upon their aged in doctrine. Right. Mm -hmm. We've established that. Now, some people, they Try to apply this verse to Christians, which obviously is totally off. There's no way you can apply it to a Christian. So in order to do that, and so that people don't get scared about losing their salvation, this is how they argue, all right? So one of them, how they're going to argue is that it's just tasting salvation, but they're not really in it. <laughs> well, bless God, when I tasted salvation, I got in it, all right? Amen. If, if you taste it something, guess what? It's inside you already, yeah. all right? It's inside your system. So that don't work, all right? So I don't know where they get that, uh, where they get that idea from. But the thing is right here, they look at verse 4. The problem is they partook the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's right. So the Holy Ghost was inside them, okay? So they didn't just taste it. It's in them. Come on. Another one is that it says if they fall away. See that? So that means they're falling off of it. Yeah. So how could they, uh, that means they were in it. Otherwise, how can they fall off? Yeah. You can't fall unless you are in something. So they didn't just taste. They were in it. Okay, so that's wrong. Number two, uh, another thing how they get around that is because they say it's hypothetical. Uh, we were like, well, what in the world? It's not hypothetical. You're right. It's not hypothetical, all right? It's doctrinal, not hypothetical. So the hypothetical is that, verse 6, if they shall fall away. <laughs> See, so in other words, <coughs> what they're saying, it, it, so Calvinists, good old Calvinists, you know, they, they mean well, but they're Calvinists and they teach wrong doctrine, all right? So John MacArthur and those guys, what they're going to try to claim in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6, is that, so it's impossible for those who are saved that in verse 6, that they can fall away and then they repent again. See that? In other words, they're trying to say this proves eternal security, not losing salvation. See, that's how they get it, because they're saying it's impossible that those who uh, tasted God, who got saved, that they can fall away and they can repent, because that's impossible. Cause that's, so that's what they're trying to say, all right? That's what they're trying to say about salvation. But uh, another pro <laughs> the other problem with that is uh, notice how when it talks about if they shall fall away, it matches with Hebrews 10, okay? Hebrews 10, go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10, notice the wording right here. Crucifying the Son of God afresh again, right? Mm -hmm. So notice how the word wording goes right here in verse 26 Hebrews 10 26 for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth 
there remaineth no more sacrifices for sins. Now that's scary. Verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood <laughs> of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Isn't that the same thing as Hebrews 6, crucifying the Son of God afresh? Mm -hmm. After you sin, you're trying to repent again? Yeah. You're doing disgrace to his sacrifice. See, that's the same thing right there. That's the same thing. It's matching up right here. So uh, notice right here that you can lose your salvation. That's scary. It's not about losing your salvation. I mean, Hebrews 10, 26, what are you going to do if you sin willfully? How many of you sin willfully after you got saved? Oh, we all did, all right? We all did. If you didn't, then you're a liar, all right? <laughs> but right here, it says that there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So we're in trouble right here, okay? Uh, notice right here, uh, verse uh, 38, 39, all right? Look at this. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, see that? You fall, it's like the same thing, fall away. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto where? Perdition. Perdition, that's, that's losing your soul. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. See, it's the same line. It's referring to salvation here. All right, so uh, let's, let's admit it. It's talking about losing salvation. That ain't hypothetical. That's doctrinal, all right? That ain't a taste. You're in it, all right? These guys don't know their Bible. Okay. Another one, uh, when you go to Hebrews chapter 6, uh, I want you to go to 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel. And then uh, we'll look at chapter 23. I don't think we'll have time to go there later, um, but maybe we'll try, all right? But when we go to Hebrews chapter 6, here's another one, how they try to get around it. So we'll read verse 7 and 8, okay? Oh, time's up. Okay, let me read verse 7 and 8 and debunk it, and then uh, I'll show you the interesting doctrine next Wednesday, okay? I can't do it tonight. All right, verse 7 through 8, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Okay, so another way how they get around this is showing verse 8. The end, they're talking about right here, the end, uh, your works are burned. So then they try to say the judgment seat of Christ, here you are with your bad works, and those things are burned, but not the soul. The soul is not burned, but the works are burned. Now, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about the works. Notice right here, uh, verse 8, but that which, okay, that's the person here. That's the being, which beareth thorns and briars. Okay, that's the works, right? Thorns and briars is the works. Is rejected and nigh unto cursing, whose end, oh yeah, whose end. Now, who's that referring to? That's referring to verse 8, that which beareth. Yeah, that's, good. that's the person that's really good. whose end is to be burned. All right, that's referring to the person being burned, yeah. not referring uh, to the works. But here's another thing. Go to 2 Samuel 23. It's a Jewish concept, that thing. It's a Jewish concept. It's not a Christian concept about Christian works being burned at the judgment seat. Again, 2 Samuel 23, verse 6. 23, verse 6. But the sons of Belial, that's, that's a person, all right, uh, okay. shall be all of them as what? Thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear, and they shall be utterly, what? Burned, Burned with fire in the same place. Now that should be playing. That's what Hebrews author was referring to following the Hebrew psalmist, David, what he said. All right, that's the language. So the thorns, they try to say is referring to the works at the judgment seat of Christ, which is not true, all right? It's referring to people. All right, so wrong, wrong, wrong. So this is referring to what? Actual people, wheat and tares. They're, you can't tell the difference. And the Bible shows that at the tribulation, God's going to have a rapture for tribulation Jews. He's going to sift the wheat from the tares, 
And then those who uh, are grown up in doctrine, they don't get deceived by false doctrine within this false so-called Christianity, right? Then God's going to say, okay, which one's the wrong doctrine? Which one's the right doctrine? So see here the fruit and then the thorns. So God's going to uh, uh, t burn up the thorns with the second advent and then have the fruit raptured up with him at the post-tribulation rapture. So that's the meaning of it. That's the meaning of Hebrews uh, 6 as well when you read about the earth bringing forth rain and fruit. But anyway, I'll prove all of that next Hebrew study, all right? So I'll show you all of that next time. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers, opened our eyes more to the truth of your scriptures, helped us grow more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.